How do you change people's minds in a time of deep divisions? Writer Anand Giridardas profiles people who are doing just that in his book, The Persuaders. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Normally, I'm talking to filmmakers on this podcast, but on this episode, I speak to an author whose books connect to documentary in many ways. Anand Giridardas was born in Cleveland and grew up between Ohio, France, and Maryland. He worked for over a decade at the New York Times as a foreign correspondent and a columnist. In recent years, he's focused on writing books, and he also contributes to MSNBC. His previous book was Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World, that asks hard questions about philanthropy. It's a bracing read for those of us in documentary who frequently interact with rich benefactors. That deserves a whole other conversation. This time, I was focused on his new work, The Persuaders, that's one of the most compelling books I've read in the last year. Anand is talking to people who do the hard work of building coalitions and trying to change minds. He talks to figures such as U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and political activist Linda Sarsour. He profiles progressives who aren't just calling out their opponents, they're also calling in new allies. They're trying to find common ground instead of breaking apart into factions. I asked Anand how he came to pinpoint the character type of a persuader and why he chose to write a book about them. Um, You know, I think we live in this moment of a profound sense of despair in American politics and a profound sense of hopelessness. And I think that's obvious to people. And I was trying to pinpoint some of the underlying behaviors and underlying beliefs and assumptions behind that despair and 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 hopelessness. Um, I was not satisfied with the idea that it was just Trump or just, you know, a few people in the Republican Party or just uh these handful of billionaires grabbing wealth and power, it it felt like there was a kind of deeper structural rot in how we all felt about each other, saw each other, thought about each other, Uh, in many ways the consequence of some of these these bigger forces, but something that had gone deep into kind of all of us. And it seemed to me that thing, as I worked on towards this book, was, was this a kind of fatalism about other people, about the possibility that other people could change, could change their mind, could change their thinking, could transcend their background. Um, You know, all around me, I just felt I was surrounded by arguments about, you know, these people will never change, those people will never change. What's the point of making an argument? What's the point of saying this? What's the point of saying that? Um, And look, I mean, you're in the documentary film game. I'm a nonfiction writer. I mean, I, my entire existence is based on the notion that people can change based on exposure to different information, more importantly, different stories, different emotional realities. Uh, I've, you know, invested my life in the notion that exposure to uh, both kind of ideas and facts and 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 the kind of inner realities of other people is not just doesn't just have the possibility of of changing things and changing people, but is is literally how things change. Um, and so I I set out to write a book, uh, kind of about that the collapse of that belief that people can people can change, and and I looked for people who were showing another way. Um, you know, people in in politics and organizing and activism uh, in other domains of of trying to make change who had who were kind of the the exceptions who hadn't given up on the idea that people can change who were still championing it often when many of their the people in their own circles in their own organizations kind of had uh, i i sought out a kind of handful of these of these persuaders who still very much we're clinging to this notion that people can change, people do change, and that that's the only thing that ever changes anything. So I want to ask you about a specific person in the book. There, there were some figures in your book whose work I'd followed, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Linda Sarsour, but 
There was one figure who was new to me named Loretta Ross, and I was strongly impressed by things that she had to say. I wonder if you can start by explaining who is Loretta Ross. Loretta Ross, you know, I, I have activists uh, in the book, of different ages and generations and and levels of experience. L L Loretta Ross, in many ways, is kind of the dean of one of the deans of activism in the book, one of the older um, veteran activists who, you know, others in the book, uh, like AOC, would kind of look to as a as a as a mentor and a, a trailblazer. Um, Loretta Ross is the, you know, in her 70s now, the founder of the reproductive justice movement, which kind of sought to broaden the fight for abortion into a more kind of holistic view of the the various things that that impinge on women's bodily freedom, um, besides just the right to abortion alone. Um, and, uh, you know, pioneering in, in reproductive area, pioneering in, in racial justice work, pioneering as a kind of feminist in general, did direct service um, work, did more political activism, you know, just a really in incredible all around thinker, doer, and and someone who is senior enough and seasoned enough and respected enough on the left in progressive circles that people might hear it if she says certain things that, you know, a 35 year old activist might not, you know, might not have the 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 medals uh, to be able to say. And and what Loretta started saying in recent years, and and what kind of led me to her and to write about her, to talk to her extensively for the book, uh, she started saying, "Look, we have a problem with." And by we, I think she meant you know progressive movements in general. Many of the movements to which she devoted her life, we have a problem with, you know, finding reasons to turn people away rather than pull people in. Right. We have a problem with um, chasing people out for well-meaning people out who get stupid things wrong because they don't know something and confusing that with people who are trying to like murder us. Um, we we have a, a problem with, you know, uh, this is my words, not hers, but a kind of taking an almost carceral approach, like a like a criminal justice kind of approach to people making trivial mistakes or not knowing what stuff is. Um, we have a problem with, you know, being obsessed with minor differences between us and our allies, instead of just focusing on the things we can do together with different people. We have an obsession with being the same as everybody in our movement, instead of saying, you know what, it's your work to lobby Congress on the environment and my work to throw orange paint on paintings at a museum. And I respect your path and you got to respect mine, right? Uh, and so she um, really had this kind of critique, which she gave out in a few different, in her some of her classes, at a graduation speech. And I was very interested in this. I felt it had not gotten enough attention. Um, and so wrote about her her efforts to kind of call an intervention on her own, on her own community, on her own movement. So she had a, a valuation that you write about um, that really struck home to me. You alluded to it uh, just now, but she identifies a phenomenon where allies might share 90 percent of the same values, but become factionalized over the debating the 10 percent wh where they disagree. Uh, and that's something I feel like I um see sometimes in the documentary community and I see in other uh, communities that I'm uh, a part of. Um, I wonder if, if you can uh, elaborate on, you know, on, on her, um, you know, philosophy around that. Yeah. So, you know, for this is something that everybody listening to this will have probably grappled with in their workplaces and their friends circle is takes so many different forms in our culture. Um, so she kind of talks about these like tiers of, of, percentages, right? So there are these people who are, you know, maybe your 95 percenters or your 90 percenters, people you agree on 90, 95 percent of things with. And the problem there she identifies is that when people are, you know, confronted with their 95 percenters and their 90 percenters, um, let's say a group that is working, you know, in the same general area, but on a different version of the problem or in a different, you know, uh, you know, angle of angle of implementation on the same problem. Um, people will really go after each other for the difference 
that kind of 5% or 10% difference um, instead of saying like, these are just like different lanes that probably should be pursued. So, you know, so, so an example of that is, you know, someone I write about in the book also, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who you mentioned, you know, getting called out on the left these days because she's kind of chosen to try to influence, you know, the Biden administration, which today, by the way, called for like new taxes on billionaires and corporations of a kind that Joe Biden was not really inclined to support during his very long Senate career. And now very much because of the advocacy of people like her, that is the proposal of the Biden White House. And she gets criticized by people who also want more taxes on billionaires for being someone who like cavorts with Biden, right? And to me, it's like quite self-evident. And I think this is Loretta's point that, yeah, you want someone yelling from outside who would never take a meeting with Biden about taxing billionaires. Sure, that's that's useful. I mean, if you have any sense of history, you know, like that is a part of how things happen. And yes, like going indoors and dealing with Biden, it, it is a different, it is a different thing. It sometimes does require you to bite your tongue. You know, so you do want some people yelling outside who are too principled to take a meeting. Sure, great. But you also definitely want someone inside trying to take a meeting. You also definitely want someone inside trying to like get something introduced on the House floor. To me, it is so self-evident that, you know, by the way, I think AOC completely re respects the person outside yelling who would refuse to take the meeting with my Biden. The problem in our time is that people outside refuse to respect how power actually works. Um, and so Loretta, but also others in this book, I think are talking about having a realistic and mature and adult understanding of how things have changed in the past and the multiplicity of approaches it takes to change it. And my approach doesn't have to be the only approach, right? And actually later on in the book, AOC gives a kind of moving example based on her father's work. He was like, he was a you know house builder, contractor, did renovations in the Bronx after all the, the fires um, in the 1970s. And you know, she she said, you know, my, my dad put these houses together. And, you know, if you're laying down wooden flooring in a house, it would be absurd to say, you know, uh, you clearly don't care about flooring in a house because you're working on the roof. No, I mean, I'm not I'm not insulting your flooring by working on the roof. It's just that I'm working on the roof, you know? And I think a lot of our movements are stuck in this notion that if I do flooring, everybody should be doing flooring. And anybody who's not doing flooring is an idiot or is captured or whatever. Um, and, and, and so I am an advocate for what I, I think of as a kind of orchestral approach to politics where we need, you know, the piano and we need the cello uh, and we need the marimbas and we need the drums and we need a conductor and we need an audience and everybody's kind of doing their job. And I, I think having that kind of orchestral or maybe you could say an ecosystem approach to making change is, first of all, just historical because that's how it has happened in the past um, and and very essential right now in a moment when I think online social media fueled culture has created this sense um, that everybody who is not exactly like you in their method of pursuing change is an idiot or a stooge. I do want to ask you about social media because, you know, I think we could all make a case for social media, positive side, being a democratizing place of conversation where it's created new ways to build awareness around movements. Um, and then increasingly, I think we're becoming more aware of making a negative case for social media, that it's eroding nuance and turns every dialogue into a snarky shouting match. Um, I wonder how you see social media in um, you know, in this process of, of persuasion. I mean, look, first of all, I think you have to start with the fact that traditionally with more centralized media, um, you know, and I think you would know this from the documentary world and what gets made and what doesn't. You could talk about it in the television world where tell TV news world where I spent some time with the newspaper world where I came up. Like 
there were too few voices being allowed to speak for most of our history, right? Um, um, you know, starting with like half the population of women until pretty recently in most of these venues, people of color in India, you could say lower caste. So in general, we have been hearing, uh, at least in the kind of amplified parts of our conversation from very few people for most of our history. Right. And, and we got very used to that, but it's, you know, it's insane. If you actually think about it, if you, if you think about the books you and I read in school and, and just like what fraction of American reality, those authors represented, it's like literally insane. It's like bad education, it was bad. And everybody thought it was okay. Like nobody, when, you know, when we were getting that education, like nobody thought it was very problematic, even very, very smart people. It did not occur to them that only reading, you know, 95% uh, of the books by one, like one gender and one race might like diminish our horizons, right? So when social media came along and said, you don't need to own the New York Times to be able to share your perspective or, or have your letter to the editor accepted to share your perspective on the State of the Union or whatever else, in general, that's an incredibly liberating thing. When, when you don't you know, have to get a record deal to put a song on YouTube. Uh, you don't have to, you know, uh, have connections in the documentary film world or or have production companies that you have access to to make a five minute short and put it out somewhere. It's been a tremendously liberating thing. And I think, you know, we have to start with that because often people go to the critique of this stuff before the basics. Like, I absolutely want to live in a world in which a lot more people can speak and be heard and like, frankly, circumvent um, obstructionist gatekeeping, you know, uh, amplification engines. Um, that said, I think a lot of how social media developed, and remember, this is not just because it's decentralized, that's because it's actually owned by a bunch of, you know, billionaire um, companies that are very interested in, in not just decentralizing, but actually using the kind of gloss of decentralization to actually, you know, build very powerful companies that engage you through addiction and 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 various other like weird, you know, behaviors. Um, social media has happened to develop this decentralized communication has happened to develop in a way that often creates very toxic behaviors. I don't think that's the only way a decentralized communication landscape could have developed. I think it's the way it happened to develop because of who has been a custodian of it and what their motives were. Um, and that culture that has developed in a kind of clickbaity, outrage uh, inducing, um, you know, trying to keep you on the platform as long as possible instead of, you know, for example, like knocking on doors in your community or whatever. Um, the particular culture it has fomented is a culture of excessive certitude, of a desire to kind of dunk on people rather than, you know, win them over. Um, a culture of kind of like, like pointing and laughing at people who disagree with you for the, for the amusement of people who already agree with you, rather than actually trying to win over people who disagree with you. Um, it's created a very strange culture that in many ways is antithetical to democratic culture, which is centered on persuasion. Uh, you know, there's these little habits on social media that I think illustrate this. When you, when you, when you, you know, you'll often see someone who, you know, someone disagrees with and they'll say, they'll screenshot that person's posts and say like, imagine thinking that X, Y, Z, right? So, so instead of saying, Look, here's why I have a different perspective on this than you. You know, or or like delete that. You know, or, or you'll you'll take like an, an idea you disagree with it and just be like delete that, right? So the idea is not that you have issued some speech and I am now issuing some speech in the hope of appealing to you to think differently about the thing. It's just like your speech is wrong. Like there's no hope for you. There's no redeeming you. Like the only thing I can do is just point out for the amusement of others, of third parties, your uh, kind of stupidity. And I think that's become a lot of our discourse. And one of the things I tried to show in The Persuaders is that 
general way of looking at other people, um, as you know, innocuous as it may seem, um, is actually just not consistent with democracy. If you don't believe other people can be brought along through reason and evidence and story and the sharing of your own reality with them, you kind of don't believe that people should rule themselves. I mean, like if 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 everybody is just like a fixed block of stone, you you kind of make a case for an authoritarian leader to just decide things for us. And I think in many ways, the reason we've ended up in, one of the reasons we've ended up in the authoritarian moment we have is not just these kind of wannabe dictators like Trump stepping in. It's that in a lot of countries in the world, uh, not just the United States, people have really moved away from this faith that there's anything they could say that would bring other people along. There's a phenomenon that's been growing in recent years in inside institutions where there are uh, they're expected to make a statement over headlines of the moment, whether it's Black Lives Matter or Ukraine, Israel, Gaza. Um, and uh, and then those statements, uh, you know, create their own uh, internal and, uh, and external debate. Uh, and, you know, questions arise of boycotting an organization because they didn't make a statement or they didn't make the right statement. Um, I wonder how you think this plays into the the process of persuasion and, and how it meets the the missions of these institutions that are whether they're arts organizations or nonprofits or you know they have um, other missions to be bringing people together and this pressure to make a statement that, um, I, I I fear is often bringing people more apart than together. Yeah, I mean I feel. Puzzled by this, and I, I'm all for taking stands, but I think there's become this weird culture of what I would call like democratized foreign policy making. And there's this kind of ex expectation that every individual, every organization, like conduct its own private foreign policy, um, and like have like you know like it, it, and it's it's of course a very like weird American thing where this it only applies to like certain conflicts that certain people are interested in, right? I, I, I've i never heard anybody condemn anyone as complicit in what's been you know, happening in the Congolese civil war um, for not having a statement, uh, you know, on the situation in Congo. I've, I've you know, um, I've worked on all kinds of issues in my career that, you know, lots of people were completely silent on because they work for organizations funded by philanthropists or because of whatever else, but, there are self-appointed guardians who decide like, you know, individuals, organizations must now have a like thought through foreign policy on, you know, various issues, uh, most notably, you know, the Gaza war right now. Um, and I think it's just very, it's, it's led to a very strange thing where people who probably broadly want similar things and actually have similar view are again, turning on each other instead of turning on very powerful interests that are actually driving these dynamics. And instead of going after, you know, very, very powerful organizations and powerful lobbies and powerful weapons companies and whatever else that are actually behind what's going on, you're like turning on the like Cleveland Museum of Art or whatever. Uh, and, and it's just a very strange theory of power. To me, I mean, I, I, I look. I think there's value in in pressure and this and that. But I often think a, a lot of what is kind of consistent across the persuaders, even though I talk to different people, different situations, is folks having like a pretty bad power analysis a lot of the time. And a lot of the persuaders I write about are really big on the notion of power analysis. It's like you need to actually have a theory and an understanding of how power works in order to change things, right? And it's often this kind of culture of like, I, I want to get my like small liberal arts college to make a statement, you know, on a war that I'm following closely, um, in part because I don't have the imagination or the knowledge to actually organize against the weapons company that is lobbying for that war to keep happening. 
right? So I'm just going to, I'm just going to punch the person I know. I'm just going to punch the organization that's like close by. And I'm not going to have any kind of analysis of what are the actual structures in the society allowing the thing I don't like to go on. So when, when we talk about values, this is a question that comes up in journalism. I mean, there, there was once a belief in objectivity in journalism that's been pretty thoroughly discredited. The more people point out falsehoods to, to that belief. And that opens a question of, you know, how and when does a journalist be transparent about their point of view, where they're starting from? Um, I wonder how you grapple with that in, in, in your journalism work. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also different kinds of journalism. You know, I used to do the kind when I was a reporter on the news side at the New York Times um, for 11 years. I did a kind where, you know, like you really did not, we're not supposed to have and did not have, you know, not just partisan political positions, but kind of just like your own fixed positions on any of the kinds of things you were, you were covering. And I don't think about that as objectivity in the sense of like the absence of any feeling. I think about it, and this is just my own, my own take on it. I think about it as like a procedure, right? Like the way a surgeon has a, a procedure, right? And like, a, I mean, people, surgeons do not operate on their own you know, spouses and children for reasons, right? But I would imagine in many cases, a really good surgeon could actually operate on their own spouse and kids with some effectiveness, not because they don't have feelings toward them, but because they have a procedure that they have done so many times that it's, that's baked into them that can transcend what they feel, right? So I... You know, I now in my, I don't work for a newspaper anymore. I, I work on books pretty much full time. Like I'm liberated from that kind of, that kind of specific pressure. But I, I very much have that. I have very clear views. My views are much more public and known now than, than when I was a reporter at the New York Times. But I still have my procedure, right? And what I, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So I, you know, personally think that voting for Trump for example, is an absolutely disastrous choice on a whole bunch of levels. And I don't think there's two ways about that. That's my personal view, okay? I also have a procedure for going to a place, figuring out what's going on in that place through, you know, studying what's for sale in the market, looking what's going on in the place, figuring out the right people to talk to, figuring out who's interesting and who's not interesting to talk to, talking to them, earning people's trust, you know, listening to their language, listening, understanding what they're really saying beneath the things they're saying, digging into the emotional substrate of what they're like. That's just a procedure I have, the way your documentary filmmakers have a bunch of procedures. And I can do those procedures, I think, I would say with some self-confidence, maybe hubris, I can do those procedures so well that it completely overwhelms and renders irrelevant how I feel about, for example, Trump voters or climate change or whatever else. Like I, I can, I would pride myself and I'd be very sad if I couldn't do that. I would pride myself on being able to go write about any Trump voter in a way that if that's what I was choosing to do, read to them as though someone had understood them better than their mother does, right? I absolutely hold myself to the, if I couldn't do that anymore, I wouldn't do this work. Now I may not choose to go write that piece. That's a different thing. But I, it, like, Tom, if I felt like I couldn't do that, I would resign, right? And so it's not to me the absence of a feeling that I have. I don't, I don't need to banish from my heart the reality of any kind of commitments. Um, it's that I need to have, like, professional protocols, procedure skills that allow me to just put that aside and do, do what I'm doing. Um, and I think we don't, you know, that that to me is at the heart of what good journalism is and does. I don't care if you secretly vote for X or Y. You know, I, I want to know that you have the ability to 
get me something about how the world works, about how a person works that someone else couldn't get me because of your, you know, qualities of insight, qualities of seeing. Um, and in the best journalism, that's what happens. Can you dig a little bit more into your own procedure? If, you know, if you're walking into the home of a Trump supporter uh, in, you know, white Trump supporter in Midwest America, and you need to introduce yourself and uh, and draw out from them where they're coming from. Um, what what are some aspects of your procedure for that? I mean, I think first of all, and by the way, I mean, even though it's not about journalism, like some of this is actually in the Persuaders book in terms of what activists do and in their best practice is not not completely unlike what you know good journalists would do in that situation, which is, you know, there's a time and place to to say what you think. And, you know, in writing, for me, that would be like at the end of the process, right? In that moment, sitting in someone's living room, you just want to get them talking, right? And you want to make them very listening. And I will say in general, in my experience of journalism, um, one of the sad things about the way the world works that you realize as a journalist is most people are under-listened to. Right. It is it, like as a journalist, when you conduct an interview with people, like it usually if, if you're like semi good at it and actually like listening and not doing like quick, you know, breaking news, but like actual the kind of, you know, book stuff or magazines stuff, you're actually sitting there very quickly. And people sometimes even tell you this. You very quickly get to a place where people are sharing things that no one in their life, including their spouse gives enough of a shit about to ask them, okay? Like, so the, the world's miserliness in terms of curiosity and care and attention is kind of the journalist's bounty. Um, so often I sit with someone I'm doing an interview with, including people who are ideologically very far from me, and and they you very quickly get to like, no one's ever asked me that. You know, gosh, I'm, I feel like I'm sitting on the couch. Gosh, I feel like I should pay you for it. I mean, it's like kind of a joke people make. But it just makes me realize like most people are not being asked the right things at dinner parties. Most people are not being asked the right things by their spouses. Like most people are not being asked the things that they're still trying to figure out, right? I, I do interviews with politicians all the time, but I'm not interested in, you know, is the bill gonna pass tomorrow? I don't even know about that stuff. Like I don't follow that stuff in that micro Washington way, right? So I will ask a Senator like, how has the role that donors play in the Democratic Party, your attitude to rich people, how has that evolved for you over time? Well, like, no one has asked that person that. I can, I don't even need to look it up to know that no one has ever asked that person that, right? Because that's just not what most journalism is doing and what TV hits are doing. When you ask someone something like that, you're actually co-creating something with them. They are thinking about it right then and there, often for the first time. And that makes them feel alive and seen and scared and all the things. But I think people like being seen and recognized and, and taken seriously. And so, you know, the heart of the procedure is just at the start, is just that, like get people talking and show that you actually want to know certain things. And then the second thing I would say, again, this is just my general approach to, I think, a lot of my work is that like, the thing is never the thing. The thing people are saying is like, never the thing, right? I mean, and, Never is a very strong word, but you know, there's usually something else going on. Um, so when I hear, you know, people in Minnesota freaking out about the border, my understanding of geography <laughs> convinces me that this may not be about the border, right? Like, I, maybe I'm wrong, you know, <laughs> like, and this is not even like urban Minnesota where you may be seeing migrants, you know near your favorite restaurant downtown. Like I'm talking about like people in like rural Minnesota are more freaked out by migrants right now than people in New York City where there are actually lots of migrants, right? So like early diagnosis, this ain't about the migrants. So what is this about? That's interesting, right? Now you may not wanna say to someone like, I don't think you care about the thing you care about, but it's going to that thing of like, you know, that, that a therapist or a counselor might do, right? But, but why, but like, but why, when did you first start getting worried about that? What, you know, and then you get to these, you get to these deeper places. I remember witnessing again for the book, 
not my conversation, but a, a, one of the people who was doing deep canvassing, which is this kind of extended door-to-door -door canvassing, political canvassing that takes place. I was witnessing in Arizona. And, you know, there's this guy on the uh, Arizona answered the door in Flagstaff, Arizona, just kind of talking about, you know, immigrants and undocumented people, you know, and being very, very disparaging about uh, people who come to the country illegally. He had a Latino last name, and it was clearly a, an important part of his identity that, you know, his story was different from the stories of Latinos who are coming illegally now and, you know, uh, kept going on and on. And, and it was just kind of, at the beginning, not interesting. It was just kind of ranty, like prejudice about other people. Not interesting. But the man had such a energy around it and he had such a, um, there was a fire and a pain in the way he was speaking. And, the, and this canvasser I was watching who is a, undocumented person themselves, undocumented um, person originally from Mexico themselves, um, was very good at, you know, again, we're switching from journalism to political canvassing here, but the same thing, which was just elicit, eliciting, eliciting, listening, getting this person to say a bunch of stuff. And then we started to get into, you know, the terrain of this person's loss of trust and loss of faith in institutions in general. And he was, I think, a veteran and he's talking about Iraq and all the friends that he lost in the war and, you know, a war that, by the way, was fought on a lie. And you started to get to this place. Like at the beginning, the guy was just saying kind of awful things about a group of people. And then you started to get into it. And you're like, this guy has been burned and he's been burned legitimately. He's legitimate to feel burned. He has lived in an era and has specifically lived the consequences maybe with kind of PTSD or or just, you know, trauma from losing friends. And he has lived an age in which trusting institutions in this country could break your heart. And his heart and he's heartbroken. And he's now hearing people say, I'll do this on the border. I'll do and he doesn't buy it. And he doesn't feel protected. And he doesn't feel safe. And he is heartbroken that people keep coming to his door and knocking on his door, asking him to vote, running ads on his TV, telling him they're going to help him. And time and again, they have not helped him. And he's absolutely correct about this. So while he may be wrong about undocumented people being dangerous or this or that, or there being an invasion, he may be wrong about that. That man was deeply, deeply right in his estrangement from the idea that anybody in power gives a shit about people like him and is and is meaningfully changing the reality he sees around him. And so getting to that truth, right? Uh, whether you're a journalist, you trying to narratively de depict him or you're a, a political actor trying to think about what can a democratic party offer him? Um, you get to a completely different answer, a completely different view of him if you stick around long enough and probe long enough to get to the thing beneath the thing. So as I wrap this up, I want to ask, after all this study you've done of persuaders in this election year, where do you see signs of potential and where do you see missed opportunities? Look, I, I think my analysis of politics in general, as I was just sharing, but I think of the 2024 election in particular is, is the following. Um, if you kind of follow along the notion I was sharing about, you know, the thing beneath the thing, um, I think 2024 is, even by the standards of normal elections, a thing behind the thing, the thing beneath the thing election. And what I mean by that is there's a bunch of flashpoints and serious issues and conflicts and, you know, the border and migrants and authoritarianism and, and you know, uh, economic policy and inflation, all these things, right? But, and, 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 you know, those are all big things, China, TikTok, you know, and, and they consume a lot of energy and that's what everybody's talking about. And, and those are the issues where there's like a change every day on each little issue. So then we chase, we in journalism, like chase each little change and have a little discussion about each new wrinkle of each little thing. This is what happened. The, here's how TikTok responded to the comments the day before. That's generally how we do the news. 
And what it causes us to miss, and there's kind of no one really on the beat of this uh, in a serious way, is what are the deeper kind of more persistent emotional substrate level stuff um, in an election year like this, right? I think most people who who I kind of trust who look at this in a scholarly way or a journalist who spend time with voters who, who I think think more deeply would say that things like giant widespread confusion around masculinity and what does it mean to be a man in an increasingly gender equal world, right? Like something like that, that's the real stuff going on, right? White anxiety and concern about what does it mean if I was raised to not even think about race or think about privilege or think about being in a majority or being central. What does it mean to live in an increasingly pluralistic country in which I must account for my position and think about others and think about these dynamics, think about history in new ways, um, you know, or technological shift? Am I obsolete if I don't know X, Y, Z? Or climate? Am I a bad person if my daddy worked in coal mining and granddaddy worked in coal mining and now I, I am I a bad person for continuing their tradition or, or you know will, will I still be a man if I if I go work for a in like marketing for a solar company um so on and so forth there are these you know what I call kind of uh, I would say this is an age of big feelings right um we talk about children having big feelings I, I think the American electorate is is awash in big feelings right now big feelings about big questions of who am I what is my place? What's the world that's coming? Will I be okay in that world? Will I will I still be me in that world? Will I recognize myself? If I do, I have to completely change who I am to fit. These to me, when I look at politics, that's actually what's happening in politics a lot of the time, and certainly in an era like this. And then the reporters are scurrying around, like asking what happened in yesterday's committee meeting, and nobody is really looking at you know, like the status threat to masculinity over the last 40 years, right? And why the pickup trucks keep getting like three inches taller on average every year. Like men are trying to tell you something. Like men are trying <laughs> to tell you that <laughs> they don't feel confident about who they are in the world that's coming. They don't feel they can say things. They don't feel they know what the right way to be is. They, they, they know they can't be like their grandfather, but they can't quite figure out how to be like their Gen Z son, right? And my essential view on the work ahead for 2024, but also beyond to beat back rising authoritarianism is we have to take seriously that emotional substrate level of our politics and then really begin organizing on the basis of that instead of just on policy and instead of just on each manifestation of these big feelings. We have to help very large numbers of people figure out who they will be on the far side of change, figure out a stable sense of self after progress. And I, you know, don't view that as a, I, I think it is nonsensical to view that as a personal responsibility. The same way I think it's, you know, stupid to view like economic flourishing as a purely private responsibility. I don't think you can just do progress and leave people to figure out who they are. I think there is a collective responsibility, not just to provide a kind of basic standard of living economically, but to provide, you know, a kind of sense of esteem. I, I And I, I think their progressive and liberal forces um, are kind of illiterate. I think progressives and liberals are much better at thinking about providing a uh, a kind of uh, a kind of basic economic existence or tending to people who are kind of economically dislocated but i think progressives and liberals have been pretty mute on the question of how to provide a kind of sense of self for people dislocated by by change changes of all kinds good changes bad changes it doesn't matter um, doesn't matter if the thing that makes you feel dislocated is something good, like racial progress, 
or if the thing that makes you feel dislocated is something bad, like China taking your job, it doesn't matter. It literally does not matter. You are now dislocated. You don't know who you are. You don't know, you don't feel like a good person. You don't feel like a good man. You don't feel like a good mother. You don't feel like a good worker. You don't feel like your kids are going to be proud of you. Literally, who cares whether your reason for feeling that is bad or good, right? I, I understand what I'm saying may be provocative because yes, of course, there's a moral difference between being motivated by racial resentment and being motivated by you know a private equity firm buying out your factory and ruining it. The point I'm making is affectively, it actually does not matter. It does not matter if you are going to show up in the public square, lashing out, believing in lies, being attracted to the worst possible barnyard leaders, how does it matter what route you got there? You are dislocated and you need to be relocated, right? Uh, economically, psychologically, whatever. And and so I, th I would say my one kind of message in closing to to you know, folks on the progressive liberal side of things um, is to kind of take that work of helping those dislocated people. By the way, transcends all identities and groups. It's not it's not just white guys. It's all kinds of people. Democratic Party is right now most bleeding black and Hispanic men. I mean, so there's all kinds of dynamics going on that are confusing here. Um, but the work of helping people figure that figure out who they'll be on the far side of change, I think, is is the core organizing challenge um, in the era of rising authoritarianism. Uh, I think it's one that we can we can achieve. I think it's it's one where there's a kind of template of these persuaders who I wrote about who show how it's done. Uh, and I think we got to learn from them if we're going to save the country and 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 more fully realize the country we're supposed to be. I want to thank Anand Giridardas for speaking with me. His new book is The Persuaders. I'd encourage you to also read his previous book, Winners Take All. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Norton Swan, newsletter manager Bella Racklin, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.